Morning all. Hopefully uh, you guys are all well and uh, managed to make it up for this one. So, as I said, we're going to have a look at covering the second part of Waves today. We'll do. We'll finish off some of the combined content. Um, we're going to start bringing in some of the uh, triple stuff as well. So if it starts getting quite high level, ask questions. Not a problem at all. It's live. Morning, Lily. Um, it is live. So yeah, feel free to drop a comment in. Morning, Olivia. And we will go from there. So I'm looking... I'm going to quickly recap the wave... Um, morning, Ben. Uh, wave diagrams from last lesson. We're then going to look at sound. We'll have a look at the structure of the ear and how that works. We're then going to have a look at um, lights and how light travels through different lenses. And we'll link that to the structure of the eye. We are then going to have a quick look at uh, how glasses work, um, visible light and how we see colour. And then we'll finish off uh, very briefly on sort of black body radiation, which sort of came in this year. And uh, yeah, perfect black bodies, I suppose. So we'll have a look at that as well. Brilliant. So quick recap then. We looked at waves last week, I think it was now. God, it seems ages ago. So we said if we've got our basic wave diagram, let's just draw a line through the middle of that very roughly. We said that actually if we had, if we took it from two consecutive points, so that would be another point there, that would be our wavelength. We said if we took half the height, that would be our amplitude. Uh, what else we say? We said the frequency is measured in hertz. And we said that the hertz is the number of waves per second. And we sort of briefly mentioned mentioned uh, wave speed as well. We looked at two types of waves, and we said we had longitudinal and we had transverse waves. So the transverse waves were 90 degrees to the direction of travel of the wave. Um, I'm not going to go through all this again in lots of detail now. If you're not sure, go back to the first video and have a quick look, um, or you can ask some questions later. That's fine. We said that longitudinal waves were the waves that were vibrating forwards and back in the direction the wave is travelling. Now, what we're going to have a look at to start with is going to be sound. And sound is a longitudinal wave. Okay? So, sound is passed on when waves that are when particles that are vibrating with that sound collide with other particles and make them vibrate as well. So, as I'm talking at the moment... The um, my vocal cords are vibrating as the air is moving over them. It's making those air particles vibrate, those air molecules vibrate. As they're leaving, they're colliding with other molecules in the air. That sound is traveling until it's reaching the microphone in the camera, or sorry, the microphone uh, down here. And it's gonna cause the membrane inside that microphone to start vibrating as well. So it's all to do with these particles vibrating. So because of that, the closer the particles are together, the faster the sound waves can travel. So generally in air, we're looking at 330 meters per second. But actually, if we go into water, then sound speeds up and starts traveling at 1600 meters per second. So very, very, very fast. We can also change the wave or the type of wave. And let me just drop this in very quickly. So we can also sort of change the wave and we can then have a look at how it changes the sound. So if you notice, as we go from A to B, my wavelength has got longer. Uh, the amplitude has got bigger. So therefore, we would expect as it's got longer, the frequency has decreased. So the pitch is going to go down. It's going to get louder, though. So we've got a lower pitch. And we've got a much louder sound. C and B, uh, they look like they've got the same wavelength. So the pitch will be the same. But C is going to be a lot quieter. The amplitude is lower, so it's going to be a lot quieter. So we can go through these and we can have a look at how the sound changes. Now, when we hear sounds, and I'm just going to drop in a diagram of the ear. So you guys know that my diagrams are quite appalling. So there we go. Let's take this one for the moment. So I nicked this one from ResearchGate on the web, so hopefully they don't mind me using it. Um, but it was quite a nice diagram. It's much better than I can draw. So this is what we've got going on inside our heads. 
So we've got the outer ear, which is helping to funnel those vibrating particles into the ear. Now, the eardrum is like a membrane. So when those particles hit the membrane, they cause the eardrum to start vibrating with a similar frequency. Touching the eardrum, we've actually got these three bones. We've got the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And the hammer is touching this eardrum and it starts making the bones vibrate. And those vibrations pass through those bones. Now, we're still not hearing it yet, just yet. So we've got those bones vibrating. What we then start doing is we start making the liquid inside the semicircular canals and the cochlea starts vibrating as well. Those vibrations move into that liquid. And there's these little hair receptors inside. And as they vibrate, they trigger electrical signals, which can then travel down this auditory nerve here. Yes, Ben, that's right. Amplitude determines the loudness. Frequency determines the pitch. Well done. Uh, I'll talk briefly about instruments as well quickly in a minute. I know, I think we've looked at it, but I will go through, come back and go through that in a moment. So, yeah, so when we're hearing things... Those particles are making the eardrum vibrate, they're making the bones vibrate, they're making that those vibrations are then passing on into the liquid inside our ear, making those little hairs vibrate, um, and then those electrical signals then get sent down the auditory nerve so we can hear things. Um, I'm quite a big advocate of the bone conducting headphones. I quite like when I'm out being able to hear things around me. Um, and they're quite cool because they don't actually go through the eardrum as such. They sort of they sit on your head in front of your ears and they actually send the um, those vibrations, that sound, through the bone cheeks, straight into, um, I'm, I'm assuming, straight into the cochlea, straight into the uh, sort of semicircular canals, um, and it sort of bypasses the eardrum, and they're absolutely brilliant. But it's well worth having to try around with if you've uh, if you've never played around with those. So yeah, what Ben was saying a minute ago, Ben asked whether the um, the amplitude and the frequency. So if we've played, or if any of you guys have played instruments before, particularly if we're looking at string instruments, they're the easiest ones to try and describe. We know that um, if we're playing a guitar, we can uh, pluck one of the strings and that string will vibrate. Now, the rate or the frequency that string is vibrating determines the pitch that's coming up that we can hear. We can change the speed it vibrates by changing the length of the spring, uh, string. So as we move our hand down the fretboard, the string gets shorter, and because the string now has less distance to travel, it actually starts vibrating faster. So we change the pitch. Um, it's very similar to uh, those really annoying students in class when they've got the rulers and they sort of ping them on the edge of the table and you sort of move the ruler in, and you hear the pitch the ruler's making go up, because as you're making the ruler shorter, it vibrates faster. Morning, Tanisha. So... Um, yeah, so it's the, the rate or the frequency of the vibration that determines what we hear. And again, we go on to a bigger string. So if we go to one of the thicker strings on the guitar, uh, they're bigger. I'm assuming now I haven't actually gone through all of this properly in terms of science, but in my head, if that string is thicker, it's got a greater mass to it. Therefore, it's going to be harder to make it vibrate as fast. So when we pluck it, it's going to have a slower vibration, which is going to give a lower pitch, which is why the strings at the top of the guitar they vibrate slower, they give a much lower pitch, whereas the bottom strings um, much thinner, vibrate faster, have a higher pitch. But with all of them, if we change the length of the string, the pitch goes up. Good question, Olivia. I'm not 100% sure. I will have to look that one up. I am assuming um, what it's doing is it's taking some of those signals um, that we would normally hear uh, and connecting them straight to the uh, auditory nerve. So Olivia's just asked um, how cochlear implants work. So yeah, I don't know exactly, but I'm assuming what it will do is it will take um, impulses from outside the body, so the sounds, convert it into a signal, and attach straight to the auditory nerve. Um, but I'll do some research and I'll come back to you on that one. Okay, but I'm not 100% sure. Cool. Any other questions about sound? So the, when we're looking at the ear then, the human ear generally can hear the range. Um, when we've got good hearing, we've got 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. 
that's our range. A lot of animals go um, massively outside of that. Um, they can hear things that we can't even sort of comprehend. Uh, but generally speaking, if we start going above the 20 kilohertz, from our point of view, we call it ultrasound. But ultrasound can go much, much higher than that, depending on what we want to use it for. Okay. So if we are looking at, um, if we look at ultrasound and imaging, when ultrasound passes through different objects, the um, when we get to a boundary between different materials or different mediums, we get a partial reflection of that ultrasound. So you can imagine if we're trying to look at uh, sort of in pregnancy, we're trying to have a look at the baby, because we've sort of going through different layers of skin, we're getting then um, through into the placenta, we've got the amniotic fluid, so we get these different medium changes. So what we'll get is we'll get these sort of partial reflections back, and then that'll be picked up by the receiver. The computer will determine that, and they'll have a look at that, and they'll determine what the reflection is, and they'll be able to translate that into an image, okay? But it is literally sending a high-frequency sound into a body um, or into a substance that we can actually go and hear uh, those reflections based on where the, the transitions of the mediums are. Okay, light. So, what I want to have a look at. This is very much a triple part of the topic. It comes up in physics at A level, it comes up in biology at A level. So it is something, if you are looking at going uh, down that line, it's worth getting your head around. Um, year nine and 10 students, again, if you're looking at doing triple, it's worth having a go at these. Now, I haven't got a rule on the screen, so I'm gonna do it as best as I can with the grid. These sorts of diagrams work really, really well if you have a very, very sharp pencil, a ruler, and you take your time with them. Now, we know that light travels in straight lines. Okay, so we should always do it as a straight line with a ruler. We know, and we looked at this, and we've looked at this before, that actually, when we go through a transparent object, so let's just say we've got a transparent block. If I was to shine light through, what we're gonna get, I wish that arrow would actually stop on the line. Let's try it there, that'll do. We know we're gonna get refraction where the light changes direction as it enters the medium. Now, when we start looking at lenses, we get the same thing happen. So let's see if I can just draw. We've got two types of lenses we need to think about. We've got convex, which are shaped like that. And we have concave, which is sort of shaped like that, ignoring my drawing. So with convex, when we shine light at a convex lens, what's gonna happen is this light is we're going to get this happen, sort of. It's going to cause this light to basically bend inwards. So we're going to get more of this sort of convergent. When we shine light into a concave lens, oh, there we go. There we go. When we shine light into a con convex, sorry, yeah, convex lens, we're actually going to get the opposite happen. Okay, we're actually going to get light diverge. And that's really important to try and get our heads around. Now, these sort of diagrams don't show much as this one, but we can actually use them by drawing proper ray diagrams and we can actually see what's going to happen. And we can start having a look at some of the uses for these. So let me try and make this a little bit clearer. I'll just move these out of the way for a minute. Right, so this is where the quality of our drawings becomes really important. What we're going to do, let's see if I can get to a straight line. We're going to start off, and this is something that if you've got pen and paper at home, it's well worth having a go with. We're going to start off drawing across, okay? Now, this line here is going to be my concave convex lens we draw it like this 
Uh, you should be able to see if I was to continue it round, we would get the shape of the lens. Um, but generally, it's much easier to draw here. Now, we're going to look at all refraction happening on this center line. We're not going to worry about um, refracting at the edges because it starts getting too complicated. We're going to have a look at all of the refraction happening on this line. Now, the shape of the lens determines very much how much the light gets refracted. And this is going to determine the focal point. So if we had a very thin lens compared to a very fat lens, this one is going to have the greatest refraction. So in other words, the light that's going to come in is going to be bent the most. So if we've got light coming in, it's going to be bent much, much more. Okay, it's going to be refracted. Bring this in further. Whereas if we have a thinner lens, we're going to get less refraction happening. Now this point where they cross over here, we call this the focal point. And if that was an image, that's where the image is going to be the clearest. So when we start drawing these diagrams, we need to work out where the focal point is going to be. Now, this obviously is a representative diagram. We don't know the actual lens. So in this case, I'm just going to make sure that my, I'm going to put my focal point in. I'm going to put my focal point in here. Now the focal point will be the same on each side of the lens. Okay. So that's my focal point. Hopefully if you can see the grid at home, you can see that I've done that the same distance. Now I'm going to draw an object. So we've got focal point one, that's F which means two times the focal point will be there. Okay. So we can start having a look at different diagrams here and we can start having a look at what the how the image is going to be affected by that lens. Like I said, this is fairly tricky if it's the first time you've done it. So I'm going to draw an object um, between F and 2F and I'm going to draw an arrow. Tell you what, let's do it the arrow going the other way. You can draw out any image you like at this point. Now, we want to determine any light that's being reflected off of this object through the lens. What is it going to have a look? What is it going to look like on the other side? Now, uses for this are going to be cameras. If you think about the fact that you've got a lens in a camera, the light comes into the lens onto a, a sensor at the back. Um, if we have a projector at school, we actually are shining light, we're shining an image out through a lens onto a board. Now, depending on what happens to the image, depends on where this object is in relation to the focal point. So to work out what happens, we just need to draw two lines. The first one is gonna go from the top of the object and it's gonna go directly through the focal point on the other side of the lens, okay? Second one is gonna go from 90 degrees Sorry, I've done that wrong. My mistake, I'll do that again. First one's gonna go from the top of the object and it's gonna go straight through the origin Second one's going to go from the top of the object to our lens, and this is where it gets refracted. It's then going to go from that point through the focal point. Okay? Where it crosses over is where this point here is going to be. So, this point here, I'll do it in red, is going to be where it crosses over. And what you should see is that our object... has increased in size. So it has been magnified. So we've got a magnified object, or magnified image, and it is inverted. Because this is light from our original shape, we call this real. And you'll see the difference between real and virtual 
when we come on a little bit later on with this one. Now, one of the things I would suggest you do with this is you can take your object and you can move it back and you can move it forwards and you can actually see how the size of the image changes depending on the position, okay? I'm gonna do another couple and I'll just talk you through so you can see how it's done again and you can see how the changes happen. But you can do this with anything. You can draw this out, you can set your own focal points, making sure they're exactly the right size, uh, so they're exactly the same distance from either side of our lens. Draw any shape and then work out what's gonna to happen to it. So let me just move this up and we'll try a different distance. I'll try and keep everything else as close as I can to being the same. So. We've got our line. We're gonna cross it over. We've got focal point F, focal point 2F. And the same on this side. Making sure we've got our correct lens type there. Now, in this case, let's just go further away. So let's go greater than 2F. So this was about too high, so let's go too high again. Um, and let's draw in our light and see what happens. So I've done everything else the same. All I've done is I've moved my object further away from the lens. So if I draw my light now from the top through the origin again, from the top Okay, what we should now see is that our object has moved closer and actually it's smaller. So the object has got slightly smaller. So depending on where we set this focus, where we set the object, depends on what the object is going to look like. <coughs> this top one, this would most likely be some form of projector. Because if you think about it when you're in lessons, what we really want to do is we want to have the image as big as possible. This would be more likely to be a camera because we're looking at trying to get a real life size. Uh, we're trying to get the image onto a sensor at the back. So this will be our camera in terms of usage. This would be our projector. Right, let's do a different one. I want to do two more just so you can see what's happening with these. Okay, so if I do one, oh, hang on. Do them both at the same time. So I'm just going to draw my lenses in. I'm going to set my focal points. I'm going to keep it exactly the same. Okay. Now, my image. Yeah, they're always done exactly the same way. I have seen, um, I have seen before with this, that if you uh, a level, I think they can put a third line in, and it should all three lines should cross over uh, perfectly. But in the case of this one, uh, yeah, absolutely fine. Two lines, and where they cross over is what's going to happen to the image. So what I'm going to do now, just so you can see what happens with this, I'm going to do that one there, and I'm going to do this one inside the focal points, it's going to be even closer. So let's just see what happens. So we're going to take a line from the top. And what you notice is the lines are actually parallel. 
So we're never going to get a clear image on this side. Okay. Um, they're never ever going to cross over. They're never ever going to converge. So in this case, we're not going to get a clear image. If I do the same thing over here, Right, what we've now got, we've got two lines that are diverging, which initially when we first look at it, looks like it's fairly useless. Um, but it does have one major use. Now, if you can imagine, if we were, let's say we were this side, that's going to be our eye, and we are looking back through this lens. So think about a magnifying glass, okay? We're looking back through the lens. Now, if I take those two lines, let's just put those back straight again. Okay, let's take these two lines. So we're gonna go from there, back along, from there, back along. Now we actually have a crossover. So rather than shining the image through onto something else, we're now looking back through the lens at the image. So now, if we look at our object, we've got this virtual image. Notice I said the difference between real and virtual earlier. We've got a virtual image. It's not inverted. Um, and it's magnified. And it looks like it's actually behind um, the normal image. Yeah, Tanishka, in the exam, um, you would, on the triple paper, and this would be quite high-end, you would be expected to be able to draw these, but they, most of the framework would be put in place. I'm not going to imagine they're going to get you to draw um, all of this out from scratch. They will probably have the objects in and get you to put the focal lines in if they're going to ask a question on this. Okay. So you do need to be able to do ray diagrams. But in this case, I won't imagine they'll get you to draw everything. Just put the lines on. But it's worth practicing. It's not, once you've done a few of them, they're fairly straightforward and it's just copying the same thing out. Um, so yeah, in terms of this one, when we're looking at the use of it. This would be a magnifying glass. Keep pressing that button. So let me just zoom out for a minute. I actually do it on purpose this time. We've got over here, we've got our projector, we've got our camera, and we've got a magnifying glass. So it all depends on the use uh, that we're looking for these. In terms of use for this one, I suppose the main thing we would be looking at is potentially if we were trying to shine light through a torch, searchlight, um, something like one of those where we actually want to just project light and not an image. Any questions there? I realise if you haven't done these before, that's a completely different. But the key to drawing these is to have a decent sharp ruler, a decent ruler, and make sure that once you've got these, you've got this, um, your lens is 90 degrees to this uh, to the horizontal line. Your focal points that you choose are going to be exactly the same distances as well. If that's done properly, the rest of it generally works out. Usually, the only time this doesn't work is when people get a bit sloppy in their drawings. Cool. Right. Um, in terms of when we look at it, concave lenses, then we've said that they cause light to diverge. Now, that means it's got to spread out, so it's going to make it harder for it to focus. So the main use of those is when we're trying to look at corrective lenses in glasses, um, maybe in some telescopes um, and sort of binoculars and things like that. So what we'll do is we'll have a quick look at the structure of the eye and then I'll show you how 
we might use the different types of lenses to try and improve eyesight. So hopefully, so if we, so Ben, Ben just asked um, about mirrors. With normal mirrors, they're gonna be a flat surface. However, if you change the shape of the mirror, you start getting some of those uh, weird effects like you used to get at sort of fairgrounds and things like that. So, you know, we sort of go in them and they make your body shape look completely different. And that is literally because it's changing the direction the light is then coming back into your eyes with. But most mirrors are going to be completely flat. So you're not going to get any refraction of the light. Does that answer your question? Okay, I've taken, uh, is it not going to place it? Oh, it is. I've taken this image. Can you let me know if you can see that? All right, in a minute. Um, I've taken this image from uh, Doc Brown's website. Um, brilliant revision site, if any of you are out there. Uh, if you want somewhere extra to go, he's covered most of the examples and everything else. He's got some really, really good work. So hopefully you won't mind stealing this to go through with some of yours, with some of you. So... In terms of the structure of the eye, again, we've got this crossover now between physics and biology. So we need to know the function of each of the parts of the eye. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll go through those now. And then what we'll do is we'll actually have a look at what's happening as the light is coming in. Let me just see if I can just move that over. There we go. Let's put that there. So we've got the optic nerve. Now the optic nerve, where it joins here, there are actually no receptors at all, and which is where we end up with a bit of a blind spot. And you can actually see the optic nerve if you sort of look into the eye. Um, and I might even, actually, I wonder if I've, let me have a look in later on. I've got a picture of uh, when the inside of my eye was photographed, when I went to have a look for uh, the opticians a little while ago. And it's quite cool, because you can actually see where the optic nerve joins the retina. So the optic nerve is just about taking si uh, signals from the retina, which is where all the receptive cells are, and then sending them to the brain. Um, this sort of sclera around the outside, this is the sort of white part of the eye that we can see. And then the vitreous humor is the jelly inside the eye that gives it the shape, that gives it the structure. It's a real shame, because I was actually planning on doing some dissections with some of you guys, and we will do this when we're back at school. Um, obviously just not for the year 11s, but it's quite interesting to be able to see. You can see all of these different parts of the eye um, when you're actually sort of working through and cutting them open. Now, we're sort of working our way down here. We've got these sort of ciliary muscles. Now, these ciliary muscles uh, are all to do with changing the shape of the lens. So the muscles are connected to the uh, lens by these suspensory ligaments. And all they're going to do is exactly what any muscle does, is they're going to contract and they're going to relax. So if you think, again, when we looked at the lenses earlier, when they contract, they're going to pull our lens and making it narrow. When they relax, the lens is going to be bigger. So we're going to change the way the light is refracted. Depending on where the light's coming from. Okay. So depending on the distance of the object, our brain is going to compensate. It's going to adjust the lens. And it's going to move this focal point forwards and back to make sure the focal point is actually on the retina, not in front of it and not behind it. So in front of the lens, then we've got this aqueous humor. Again, it's just a name for this liquid. We've got the, uh, the iris and the pupil. The pupil is just the opening in the iris. And the iris is, will open and close depending on the amount of light. So if there's too much light out there, we'll damage the retina. So the idea is if we go into bright conditions, the pupil closes down, reducing the amount of light into the eye. Uh, and likewise at night, it opens up to let more light in onto the retina. Uh, and then the cornea is what's protecting the eye, protecting this opening. Because at the end of the day, this pupil is just an opening straight into the eye. So we've got the cornea on front. 
Um, this is the bit that actually, if you spend too much time outside without sunglasses on, the UV rays that normally cause skin tan, uh, yeah, skin tans, can actually cause um, the cornea to start going cloudy. We call that cataracts. Um, it's a bit like looking through sort of milky liquid, and it makes it very difficult to see. So that's the structure of the eye. Now, the problem we can get is sometimes when we're looking at objects, what's going to happen is as the light's coming in, if you can imagine if the retina was here, if I actually, let me just do, if the retina is here, if the light is focusing behind the object, the retina, we're going to get a blurred picture. If the light is focusing in front of the retina, we're going to get a blurred picture. So in this case, what we need to do is we need to move the focal point by using corrective lenses, by using glasses, to make sure that it actually ends up on the retina where we want it to. So in this case, what we would do here is we would use a convex lens because a convex lens is going to, is going to cause the, the light to converge. And actually, if we can cause the light, let me just change that. If we can change the convergent point here, so it's actually shining at a slightly different angle into the lens, it's going to move that focal point backwards. Here we're going to use a concave lens because what we want to do is we want the light to enter at a slight outward angle because that means the lens, this focal point is going to move backwards. But all glasses are trying to do is trying to get that focal point to be on the retina, not in front of it, not behind it. Does that make sense? So yeah, it's getting to the stage. I was there the other day and uh, although the opticians, I don't actually need glasses yet. I tell you what, they're definitely helping. It won't be long before I need a formal prescription. Um, I definitely had some the other day and they were definitely of use. So yeah, it's getting there. It's an age thing. Too long in front of computers. Getting old. Okay. Let's move on. No other questions have come from that, so let's hopefully that's okay. Ah, okay. So, Tanishka, with um, that, I am assuming, and I'm not 100% sure on this one again, I am assuming it's got to be the... Um, move this back down again. It's got to be this bit here. Because as far as I'm aware of, any other part of the eye, if someone was going to get tattooed, not, I can't even think why, but yeah, any part of the part of the eye if you'd get it tattooed, would damage the function of the eye. So this is just the white bit. So I can't think of anything else. Okay, let's have a look then at... So we'll look at stigmatisms, um, Olivia. We're looking at uh, different shapes of the eye. So sometimes the eye, depending on the, uh, the shape and the, the sort of liquid they can end up uh, rugby ball shaped. And again, that's going to change the way the light moves into the eye and where it actually ends up on the retina. So it's one thing they can pick up fairly quick. Uh, other issues some people have, um, I know my daughter's had it from quite a young age, is you can end up with what they call this sort of lazy eye, which is where some of the muscles work more than others. So actually we use glasses then to try and um, help the eye so the muscles don't have to work as well. So it actually reduces the amount they're pulling those eyes around. Okay. Hi, Carl. I wasn't sure. I thought it was, judging by the uh, name you were using on the chat, but I wasn't 100% sure. Um, lots of reasons why people could be born blind. We could have um, damage to the retinas. We could have, um, or say damage, or even just uh, different ways those uh, to the, those cells. We could have damage to the optic nerve. So I think if the optic nerve isn't connected properly to the retina or isn't connected to the brain, um, we're generally getting issues there. Sometimes we've got issues with the the, the sort of shape, the colouring. Anything to do with that eye is going to cause issues there. Yeah, Lily, exactly right. Um, the whole point of the pupil is to try and protect the retina. So we have um, 
Cats retinas, sorry, cats pupils open much more than ours. So, which is why they have such good vision at night. But the whole purpose of the pupil is to literally open and close so that we can actually control the amount of the iris open and close to control the amount of light going in just to protect the retina. So if any of you have been anywhere where there's lots of snow, generally you have to wear goggles or sunglasses most of the time because the problem you get is with the light coming in from around you and the light reflecting off the snow, it's twice as much as we would normally receive. Uh, and it's really what we can end up with is again, exactly the same way as we get a suntan, is that light can actually damage the retina and cause blistering um, in the same way we get sunburn, but on the inside of the eye. Uh, and that's meant to be really, really painful. So the pupils are literally there to control as much as possible to stop too much light getting in. But obviously at night, we want the pupils to be as big as possible. So animals that spend a lot of time at night, and if you look at, uh, if you go online and look at some of the pictures of nighttime animals, they generally have huge pupils to let as much of the light in as possible. Hi, Destiny. Was that a question you had there, Destiny? Okay, I'll carry on for a minute. If you've got a question, post it. Um, what I have a look at is how we see different colours. So... This is one of those weird topics that it seems to come up in Key Stage 3 and it seems to come up in Triple, but they haven't really included it properly in Combined Science. But it definitely comes up in Key Stage 3 as well. So it won't be completely new to you. So let's have a quick look. If we have, I'm just going to draw a couple of um, different colour shapes here. And we'll stick with the sort of primary colours for light. Actually, let's see if I can do it filled in. Notice I said the primary colours for light. Um, if you're an art teacher, you'll say the primary colours are generally going to be um, red, blue and yellow. Because we're looking at absorption. And we're going to look at absorption now. When we're looking at light, we're looking at green. Um, so I'll put a yellow one in there as well. It makes no difference at this stage. So we've got some form of light source. And we're just going to say it's going to give off uh, white light. So... There's my light bulb. And it's given off light. And we've got somebody here. And they're looking at these different objects. So our light is traveling and it is hitting these objects. Okay, and some of that light is reflecting back into the eye. So the color of the light depends on which colours get reflected back. The other colours get absorbed. So we know that actually when we're looking at coloured light, and this was brilliant the other day, uh, my sister drew a picture of a rainbow that she was going to put in the uh, window of her flat. Um, and she drew this lovely rainbow. And then my five-year-old son looked at it and went, yeah, but the colours of the rainbow aren't right. And she went, what do you mean? He said, well, they should be our sort of red, orange, yellow green, blue, indigo, violet. And it was just brilliant. I didn't even know that he knew those in the correct order, but he came up with them. So white light is made of all of these colours combined. Now, when that hits an object, some of those colours are going to be absorbed by the object. So if we're looking at red, all of the other colours apart from red are going to be absorbed. And the red light is the one that's going to be absorbed, is going to be re reflected back if we look at the blue light again the white sorry the, the blue object all of the colors apart from blue are going to be absorbed by the object and the blue object is going to reflect the light back to the eye and the same as we're going through here as well and when we see different colors it all depends on which when we see different colors it all depends on which colors of light are being reflected and which colors are being absorbed generally the darker the objects the more the colors that are being absorbed so when we look at a black object so if we were to draw a black cube now
then actually that light is hitting that black object none of it's being reflected now this is going to bring us on in a minute to what we call sort of perfect black bodies in terms of black body radiation but in this case the object is looking black because it absorbs all of the light none of it is reflected black which is why when people sort of start talking about black not really being a color uh they say it's not really a color because there's no ref light reflected back off of it it's pretty much just an absorption of all of those colors okay so also when we sort of think about the sort of clothes you wear in the summer we often try to wear fairly bright clothes white clothes okay so ben with a rainbow the rainbow is white light but generally, if you think about the conditions that we need to be able to see a rainbow, those conditions we generally need, it's just been raining. So we've got loads and loads and loads of water droplets um, in the air. So when the light is shining through those water droplets, each water droplet slightly refracts the light. So when we look at a prism... I think this was one of the recent exam questions we sat on the mocks. Uh, let me just draw a triangular prism for a minute. I think you had this. I can't really draw white on uh, light on here, so it's going to have to be a black line, I'm afraid. But if we were to shine light into this prism, what we end up with is the light itself gets refracted different amounts. And the amount it gets refracted... The amount it gets refracted depends on the wavelength of that light. So what you end up with, I'm only going to draw two on here, is we actually ended up with this light getting refracted more or less as it's going through the medium and separating out into the rainbow. And that is literally to do the refraction based on the different uh, wavelengths, the different frequencies of those lights. So when you're looking at a rainbow, each little tiny raindrop is a tiny little prism those prisms then refract, and as we're doing that over the whole of the sky, and you think about the amount of rain droplets and the amount of moisture that's in the sky, we end up with one eventually giant prism, which is what helps us see the rainbow. And you can always tell a good quality rainbow, because there's usually two of them, and they're actually inverted, which gets really weird to see. Um, but yeah, you can normally see two rainbows if you look really carefully, depending on where it is. So let's just go back up here for a moment. So, um, black objects absorb all the light. The other colours absorb all of the colours apart from the colour we see. And if you really want to play with your head, they go, well, actually, is it really that colour if that's the colour that's not being absorbed? But anyway, that's one of those we're not going to worry about too much at the moment. Um, other words that's worth having it keeping in mind here. We've obviously got so sort of key words we've been looking at, or we should be looking at, Transparent, translucent, opaque, absorption, and I'll talk about all of these in a moment, transmission, reflection. So in an exam, if we're trying to use these words properly, um, transparent means that all of the light is going to be transmitted through that object. So if you think about glass, glass is transparent. So it's going to transmit the light through. So all of the light goes through, so it's transparent. Translucent will only transmit some of the light. The light that's not transmitted will be absorbed. Okay, so we're using these last three quite a bit in order to try and explain these three here. Obviously, if it's such subject, yeah, the surface is shiny, then it might be reflecting some of that light. With an opaque surface, none of the light is being transmitted, but some of it may be absorbed or reflected depending on what the material is okay 
So absorption, the light energy is being absorbed by that surface, by that object. <coughs> Transmitted means it is passing it through and reflected we know means it's bouncing it back. So having those sort of key words in your heads and trying to use them properly really does make life a lot easier. Okay. Now, brings us on pretty much to the last sort of part of this, and it's it's quite a new topic. So if, even from a teaching point of view, I've not really taught much about what we call these sort of perfect black bodies and black body radiation. So the theory behind these sort of black bodies um, and the black body radiation is it's a surface that absorbs all of the light. Um, or all of the rays that so none of it is reflected and none of it is transmitted. So the perfect black body. Now we could be talking about black holes. Um, we, I mean, I saw something I think last year. Scientists have managed to produce the blackest paint ever, uh, because what they're saying now is it will even absorb colours outside of the visible light that we normally see. So when we're looking at this sort of idea of the perfect black bodies. or surface, we are looking at 100% absorption. So there's no transmission, there's no reflection. Now, one of the benefits of this is not just absorbing all the lights, but anything that is a good absorber is also a very good emitter. So if we have an object that's very, very good at absorbing energy, it's going to be very, very good at emitting energy. So actually, we can use this in two ways. If you have a look at, um, I think some, you may have seen some houses have, um, not solar panels, but they have sort of black pipes or these black areas on top of the roofs for heating up water because it heats up the hot water in the house, which means their boiler doesn't have to do as much work. And those pipes are generally going to be black because they're going to be um, better at absorbing the energy from the sun and the area, the energy around it. Now, as long as the water running through those pipes is colder than the energy it's receiving from outside, it will be absorbing energy. The problem you get is if we try to run hot water through it, you would actually have the opposite happening. You'd actually be cooling your water down because it would then be um, emitting. And I could put emission down here now as one of our other keywords. It would be emitting the energy back out as well. So we can use them for two different things. We can use them for heating up. Uh, we can also use the ideas behind this um, for cooling objects down as well. But realistically, when we look at things, I mean, I suppose the perfect black body would be something like a black hole in space, because at that point, it's absorbing all of, there's no reflection, there's no transmission, all of the energy it receives, it keeps hold of, it absorbs. Right quite a tricky one for some of you guys if you haven't seen that before uh, we can pick up on any areas that you don't know or that you didn't make sense uh, a bit later on but has anyone got any questions because I'm about five minutes early for finishing so I can go through any of that uh, as usual what I will do is I will export these notes out in a moment I will put them onto Google Classroom for you uh, and if you think of questions later on that you didn't ask now again put them in Google Classroom or email me uh, and I'll go through them as well. But it's, uh, yeah, slightly more tricky area there, but quite a lot we've covered. Okay, so no immediate questions. I will say have a good day. Enjoy yeah, Tanisha, I've got those questions. Um, I'm going to respond to those later on. Um, it's been a bit busy. I'm currently working on a project at the moment, preparing some lessons for um, Egypt and Japan, um, bizarrely enough. So uh, I will get around to answering your questions later on, Tanishka. Um, and Olivia, I've got your marks as well. I'll get those sent back to you a bit later on as well. Uh, I won't be doing any live lessons over Easter. We've been told not to for the moment, but I may put another couple of videos up um, that will be of interest or of use. Uh, I will still be online. I'll still be connecting emails. So the next live stream, I say I won't be doing over Easter. I might do, but I will email everybody and I'll put it in classroom. But we'll see how it goes. 
But any questions, any concerns, any topics you want me to cover, please drop me an email or put it in Google Classroom and I'll help out in any way I can. But otherwise, stay safe and enjoy yourself. Okay? Take care. See you soon.